Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, fellas. My name's Sia, and I am an alcoholic. Hi, Sia. And uh, can you hear me okay? I really appreciate being invited up here. I actually think about this group from time to time. I don't think it was too long ago I thought, like, so why hasn't Bob called me? Isn't Bob going to call me and invite me back? And uh, Bob did call me and invited me up here. And uh, when we were confirming, I said to him that when I think of you, because I've met some of you in other rooms as well out on the AA road, um, I think of that thing Bill Wilson said, you know, that, there's an oasis here, and it's great because it's a desert, you know, a veritable oasis. You, you're you a real bastion of sobriety, and, and so it's wonderful to be here. I would also like to welcome the newcomers. I'm very glad you're here. Uh, I don't know how you're feeling. I didn't feel particularly well when I was new, and uh, but I feel great, and, and it's worth the wait. Um, what has happened for me is that I've been given a program, and I believe that as long as I do what I think God's will is, I, I've been given a program that matches calamity with serenity. And um, it's a portable thing, and it means so much to me. I'm a fear-based person without a program, and my fear activates my defects. It's a, a miserable way to live, drunk or sober. And, and I don't have to live like that anymore, and, and neither do you if you are new. Uh, I do remember when I was new that, that I felt terrible sometimes, I remember feeling so bad, I wondered why I didn't, like, just die in the saddle. You know, uh, I rode with the four horsemen of the apocalypse, like everybody else in this room, and, and the book enumerates those as terror, bewilderment, frustration, despair. Sometimes I wondered, what I learned here is it's not just the physical effects of my drinking. This is alcoholism. So it's also about the mental and spiritual anguish that I'm capable of bringing to my life. And I just wondered why I didn't have like a spontaneous suicide sometimes. I felt so bad about myself. And I remember when I got sober, I I was ill at ease. I I wasn't used to being sober for long stretches of time. And uh, I felt uncomfortable with some of the things that I had done. And um, I, I felt like maybe I didn't deserve to be sober in a way. And Alcoholics Anonymous said that's that's not true. And if you're new here and you feel like you don't deserve sobriety, it's not true. And um, I remember feeling, uh, I don't know, you know, the literature says that we suffer from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. So I guess the alcoholic feels hopeless. You know, I, I felt hopeless. And, and if you're new, maybe you feel hopeless. But see, you're wrong, because it says seemingly hopeless. And, and the price of admission in Alcoholics Anonymous for me has been being wrong. That was part of the surrender, you know. I, I was wrong about my drinking, and I was wrong about my outlook on life. In AA, it's called our old ideas. I, I was wrong about a lot of things, and, and if you're new here... I hope that you would be willing to to be wrong because I think because I was willing to be wrong, I got to live, and and then I've been able to prosper here. And I also remember when I was new that, um, like, the center of my life was gone. It it felt like my guts had been kicked out or something. There there was no purpose. What are you supposed to do? You know, where do you go? Whereas Alcoholics Anonymous seemed ecstatic on my behalf for this spiritual opportunity, which, like, translated into a coffee commitment. And and uh, <laughs> I, I, I tried to tell myself that you were quaint, you know. I, I tried to be scathing about the whole thing. I, I couldn't quite muster it up. And uh, the fact of the matter is that for times, periods of time in my life, I thought I was like the weirdest person on the planet. I, I felt sure of it. And I had no idea I had all this company, you know. And... Uh, before I identified in Alcoholics Anonymous, I, I think that I used to be suicidally depressed. You know, I would feel suicidally alone. I was suicidal, I'll tell you that much. Uh, uh, suicide was my hobby. As we say in AA, I just wasn't very good at it. Like, um, I, I live in California, for example. 
we have earthquakes there. And so I'd, I'd park under a bridge, and I'd just wait. You know what I mean? <laughs> and eventually, I mean, you just can't stand it anymore. And, and, uh, and so uh, I, I, I'd take matters into my own hands sometimes, and I'd just take a handful of pills. And, you know, I'd wait again. But, like, one time it was no dose, so we're all still waiting. And uh, that was bad. And then I just thought, okay, I'd get fed up, and I'd think, you know what, I'm going to starve myself to death. You know, I'm skinny, and I guess I felt like I had kind of a head start. But, but I would, uh, I'd land in the hospital, or more often I'd end up, like, binging at Winchell's in no time, you know. So, so that didn't work out. And, and part of the problem is that without a program, I'm an incredibly ambivalent person. I, I, without a program, I am suicidal. But I'm afraid to die, and it's hard to reconcile those, you know. <laughs> and uh, without a program, I, I, I cannot wait to meet the next man in my life because I'm going to fall in love with him, apparently so that I can start hating his guts as soon as possible. <laughs> because that's what always happens. You know. <laughs> you know. And um, I, I, I really needed to feel, I needed to be invited to everything. Be in the middle of everything. Not that I was, but I needed it badly because I felt so separate from. And, and the problem was with that at the same time, like you invited me up here to share, and it's wonderful. But if, if I'm not working a program, I'm like consumed with self-centered fear, and it's this terrifying experience, you know. And um, this ambivalence that I felt also translated into AA. Because to me, um, at first glance, Alcoholics Anonymous was the place where God lived, I guess, and and um, I found out that God was like my biggest geographic, and 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 then there's those those two sister steps, four and five, and eight and nine. I thought those were pretty ominous, and and uh, and that bothered me. And um, on top of that, I'm like, without a program, a quitter. I'm just a quitter. I, I I'm not steadfast. I, I can't stay the course, you know, and. From very early on in my life, when, when some of the little friends I had excluded me from a social engagement, I extrapolated that into the whole world. The whole world didn't like me. And so what I did is I retreated to the bathroom stall in school. And, and it became like a metaphor for my life in a way, because, of course, we know the bathroom stall locks from the inside. And, and um, what I did is I made a decision based on self, which would put me in a position to be hurt, because of what I thought you were thinking of me. And, and I didn't feel good enough to be a part of my family. And uh, I felt less than in my family, and so I quit my family. I mean, um, I don't recall exactly mentioning that to them, and I didn't move. I didn't move out. I was like eight at the time, you know, but... <laughs> But that's how I responded. I would just quietly withdraw. And, and when I was old enough to exert my will, I, I quit the church that I grew up in. And, and I quit the town where I grew up. And um, when I started drinking, I would quit town after town after town. And I quit this country. I guess you could say I quit my name, you know. And um, in all of that, I didn't really stop and think that there was the common denominator of me. You know, maybe there was something something wrong with me, you know. Um, as close as I might get to it is that there might be something wrong with me because of, of what you did to me, you know. And um, the fact of the matter is that I exhibited antisocial tendencies, I think is the technical term, but I would say I just did stuff funny. Um, for example, I did something funny with the Girl Scout cookie money a long time ago. And uh, I, I thought they suspected me. And, and I thought they were going to ask me to leave. And, and so what I did is I just beat them to it. You know, I quit. I quit. And um, But, you know, when it got right to it, I, I couldn't quit drinking. And what are you supposed to do then? Where do you go? You know what I mean? And um, I grew up in churches. I know you can go to church and make a pledge, for example, but why would I do that? Why would I go to church and make a pledge? And, you know, Bill Wilson in his Bible, which is in his home, the foundation in New York now, there was line after line where he, he wrote his name and he dated it. He, like, made a solemn oath. So, so I know you can do that to quit, but why would I go to church and make a pledge? Because I can't quit. And, and, and there's Alcoholics Anonymous, right, that we go to if we can't quit. 
But I don't know if I knew about AA, or maybe I wasn't ready for AA, so I, I didn't do that. And I thought about the people in jail, and I wondered if they made the people quit in jail, you know. But I thought, how can they make you quit if you can't quit? And, and to my mind, that was just like interrupting, and it was rude, you know. And uh, and then I thought about these these people and these institutions that, that make you afraid. And I guess they think if they make you afraid enough, you're going to quit, you know. Like my family. My family was going to throw me out if I didn't quit drinking. And then there's places that, that do intervention. And And the thing is, I guess maybe I started drinking over my problems. You know, that's hard drinking. Hard drinkers do that. But somewhere along the line there, I got separated from the pack, and I became alcoholic. And, and my point here, here is this, that, that I was afraid. I was as goddamn scared as the hard drinker was scared. I, I was scared I would lose my family. And you know what happened to me? I lost my family, and the hard drinker quit before they lost theirs. And, and then I was afraid I was going to lose this little I'll-show-you job I had, and you know what happened? I, I lost my job. And the hard drinker quit before they lost theirs. And, and then I lost this other job. And then I reached a point where I, I was, like, afraid I was going to die and that there was nothing I could do about it, that I might have to die of alcoholism to quit drinking. And um, at that point, you know, I guess at the 11th hour, 59th second, 59th, what is it, 59 minute, 59 second, you know, the alcoholic, we, we want another chance, you know, and, 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 and I thought I, I wanted to stop drinking. I, I wanted to stop drinking for the rest of my life is, is what I thought. And... Um, that's when Alcoholics Anonymous made a suggestion to me. And what you said to me is, you know, Sia, you don't really have to stop drinking for the rest of your life. Maybe you would stop drinking today. Does that interest you? That's what we do here. We don't drink today. And if you're new, there's a lot of new people here, you know, I'll ask you, does that interest you? And so, you know, I thought about it, because you can. <laughs> and, and, and I thought about the fact that... Um, most of the time, or a lot of the time, I seemed to wish I was dead. I thought about the fact that periodically I would try to take my life. I thought about the fact that I could now not stop drinking, and, and I didn't know where that, where that would end up. And, and then I thought again about AA, you know, with God who lives in AA and these sister steps that were very sinister. And, um, you know, when it got right down to it, I was interested. I was interested. And um, it says in our book that willingness is the key. You know, if you want what we have, maybe interest qualifies. Because what happened is that um, I believe the book says that the problem was removed from me. I think it says it that way. And so what happened to me, in my words, is that I, I was struck sober by God. I I'm no more able to stop drinking tonight than I was all that time ago. January 29th, 1983. My sobriety is January 30th. And... Um, I, I was struck sober. I, I think that's why Bob invited me here. That's my whole purpose, you know. It's it's this pedestrian miracle that takes place in Alcoholics Anonymous. In our meeting here, meetings everywhere, <clears throat> excuse me, all over the world. And then AA has given its steps to treatment centers and hospitals, so it's happening there. And AA has given its steps to other problems, so it's happening there. So it's happening all over the place. But just because it's happening all over the place, it's still a miracle. You know what I mean? And and the fact of the matter is, when I say God struck me sober, what it means to me is I was like a drowning kid. And a parent sees their kid drowning. They don't wait for the kid to yell help. They yank him out of there. And and I feel like God yanked me out of there. And, and I don't think I really understood what was going on. I, I don't think I really got the spiritual compact that God seems to have with Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, and And as a result of that, you know, this circle and triangle, unity, recovery, service, that beautiful triangle, which is this perfect thing mathematically, adds up to 180 degrees, no matter what size it is or, or what plane it's on. And it's such a great symbol for AA because AA is this spiritual principle which works perfectly for the alcoholic that would work the program. And um, what I started to do, because I did not understand this, is, is I started to take credit for my own sobriety. I don't know, I guess maybe I thought I wised up or something. And um, because I took credit for my own sobriety, today would not be God's day. Today is my time, my time. And, you know, um, it starts to be, instead of being divinely inconvenienced, as see wonderful old-timers in, in our meetings say, it starts to be a pain in the neck for me <laughs> to take part of the day off. 
and come up here to Las Vegas, maybe. It would be a pain in the neck because, see, when, when I take credit for the program, I revert to type. I become selfish, and, it, and it's mine, and it's about me, and, 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 uh, and I want to start thinking about things I'd rather do, places I'd rather go that I've never been to, maybe. Uh, Alaska is one. I, I mentioned Alaska because I, I saw a program recently that interested me about Alaska. It's this guy. He's just going to Alaska. And, uh, and then out of nowhere, he goes, he couldn't stop drinking. Well, so now I want to know what happens. Do you know what I mean? Because I can't stop drinking either. How does it end? How does it go? And uh, I know when I drink, I'm nomadic. And so I know the guy's taken a geographic. And, and he's kind of a magical thinker, too. I think alcoholics are. I mean, I feel like we have to be, don't we? What is the matter with us? You know, hasn't somebody <laughs> challenged you? Hasn't somebody said to you, what's the matter with you? What do you mean you can't stop drinking? Anybody can stop drinking because, of course, they can, you know. And, and, and they go like, I remember one, one lady said to me, so, I mean, did somebody do this to you? Is that what you're saying? Is it a curse? Was it a witch? You know, and, uh, and, and, and that, you know, it, it's not addictive. It's not heroin. And, and you know, they're right. <laughs> it's not. If you're new here, I would like to say to you, there's a, an old tradition in AA. We say, try to listen to the similarities, not the differences. But if you've come here from somewhere else, I, I strongly suggest, based on my experience, that you listen to the differences between AA and other places. And one of them is this that's very important to me. Many places talk about addictions. Alcoholics Anonymous does something else with it, which has been very helpful to me. I know if 10 people use heroin, they're going to need it. I know if 10 people use crystal meth, they're going to need it. I know if 10 people drink alcohol, they're going to get drunk. But only one lucky dog becomes an alcoholic. And, and, and so, so what is it? You know, what is it? And, and, and the, the pioneers of AA, they wanted to know, what is it? And they went to a professional. They went to a doctor. You know, Dr. Silkworth, the only non-alcoholic in the book. And they said, so what is the deal? And Dr. Silkworth said that he thought it was an allergy. And I don't know about you if you're new, but... I, I try to be in that book and put myself there because I want to stay here, you know. And, and so I thought about this allergy thing, and I thought, I, I, you know, I understand allergies. I, I'm allergic to penicillin, and, and I have a friend who's allergic to peanuts. And I know if my friend eats a peanut, like, her throat swells up and she's going to die. So here's what else I know. I'll tell you this. My friend is not eating a peanut today. <laughs> and my friend's not eating a peanut tomorrow. She's never having a peanut, okay? <laughs> Unless there's some tragic misunderstanding in a kitchen someplace. And, uh, and I know that sometimes when uh, I was drinking, I'd have a bad day. And maybe I'd go home and drink a bottle. And what I know is my friend, this peanaholic, if she has a bad day, she is not going to go home and eat a jar of peanut butter. You know what I mean? <laughs> She's not. And, and the people that live with her, they're not, like, marking the jar to see if she's sneaking any, because that will never happen. Do you know what I'm saying? And, and whether there's even a jar of peanut butter in the house or not, she really could care less. Because, see, her relationship with the peanut is over. <laughs> they're never getting together again, okay? And you know what else I found out? What else I found out? I was in a store one day. I was looking at something, the ingredients on the back of the can. It was not peanuts. But anyway, what it said on the can is the, the equipment used to process this food, like touched a peanut once. <laughs> so if you have an allergy to peanuts, right, no point of purchase. And you know what I suddenly realized? I realized that, like, these peanaholics, they're probably fanning out all over the world with, like, a magnifying glass, you know, and, and they're looking at the ingredients because, see, they never, ever want a close encounter with a peanut in their lifetime. And, and so because of that, I know there will never be a Peanaholics Anonymous. And I know that there will never be Peananon either, right? And, uh, <laughs> however, if... If they had the second part of this that Dr. Silkworth proposed to Alcoholics Anonymous, if they had the peculiar mental twist that I have, if they had the obsession of the mind that I have, they'd have to eat the peanut. They'd have to eat more than one. Have to eat them all the time. You know what I mean? Think about it. They'd have to eat them even if it killed them. The 911 lines would be jammed all over the universe. And, and, and the reason they'd have to do that, and the reason that I had to do that, is because... Uh, well, I can't live with the physical effects of alcohol, 
I can't live without the spiritual effects, you know? And, and so I think there is a distinction with alcoholism, and I think it's a very important one if you're new. And I would hate to have alcoholism in the back of the head like a wet mackerel, you know what I mean? So, so let me just submit that to you for some consideration. I mean, there's something really wrong with me <laughs> to come up here, take the day. I got a new boss coming in. I was telling Bob, we got a new chancellor coming in. I just hired somebody. I was sick last week. I'm in school. I'm busy. To come up here to talk to you for, like, we hang out for a couple hours, why? And, and uh, I'll tell you why. It's because there is something really wrong with me. And remember, like, in the book where Roland goes and talks to Carl Jung, and he's had it, he's had it, and he says, just tell me the end of the story, okay? And, and so Carl Jung says something to him like, you have the mind of a chronic alcoholic. I have never seen one single case recover. One single case. Has a doctor ever said that to you? I mean, that would be a bad day. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Not to mention this world-famous physician. And, and then he went on to say to Roland that what he'd been trying to do with Roland was rearrange him emotionally so that he could have this, this vital spiritual experience. But he'd never succeeded with an alcoholic of that description. And when I read that, here's what I found out. I found out that there is no psychotherapeutic solution for alcoholism. There's just not. It has to be a spiritual solution for a spiritual problem. And I tested that. I mean, I thought, is there a precedent in the world for this that I can think of? And, you know, there is no pharmacy open at the Wailing Wall, I noticed. And um, the Catholics don't give therapy before communion. They have absolution. They have confession. And, and so I decided that has to be true. And, and Alcoholics Anonymous is the only viable solution for me with a, a spiritual problem. And uh, so I just, if you're new, keep an eye out for things about AA that are unique. The reason is because AA works so very well. And um, so going back to this guy, there he is. He's in Alaska. He can't stop drinking. And he comes up with a crazy idea, and I've had a few, haven't you, to quit drinking? And uh, none of mine add up to more than, like, uh, just go stand out in the street here, see ya. A car will knock you down eventually. You'll stop drinking then. That's as good as I've got, you know. Uh, the only other one I could offer you is, is to pray. And that's not mine. That's Alcoholics Anonymous. But to say to you that the consciousness of the presence of God is the most important thing in my life is so crazy sounding. <laughs> if you haven't had it happen to you, if you haven't had to live there a day at a time, you know, and, and I do and I have. And, and so um, he comes up with this crazy idea, this guy. He's, he's at this grizzly reserve, the animals are being poached, and he thinks that maybe if he would try to protect these animals, perhaps the universe would confer upon him the ability to, to stop drinking. And you know where this world-famous physician fails with Roland, this guy hits the jackpot. You know, it does say in our book that occasionally there's phenomena outside of AA. AA has this wholesale miracle going, but occasionally somebody sobers up on their own. And, and this guy stopped drinking. He couldn't believe it. Neither could I. You know, it's like a miracle. He said it like five times. I thought, yeah, I, I get it, pal. I get it. And then it was like this fairy tale or Disney movie. He starts making these films of these bears, you know, and he's sending them all over the world, and he's getting famous. And um, one day, he doesn't even have the audio feed off the cam. He has the audio feed on, but he doesn't have the cap off the lens of the camera. And what happens is one of these things turns and um, just eats him alive. And his girlfriend, for good measure. You know, it's all recorded. And, and my point in mentioning this here tonight is, um, if you're new, it's just not going to get that bad here in Alcoholics Anonymous. You know what I mean? <laughs> this will never happen to you here, see? There's lots of ways to try to stop drinking. But this one is not dangerous. And, and, and I just... When I came here, you know, um, I got this thing going. I was kind of in a bad mood, like, oh, it's come to this kind of deal. And, and I thought if there's any newcomers here like me, I could cheer you up. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, we're here. We're sober. We're so lucky. And um, later on in this documentary, some guy said that Tim, this guy that died, got what he deserved. And, you know, I remember thinking, God bless you. The guy just didn't understand. You know, people don't. And that is why we have Al-Anon. I mean, people want to kill us. You know, I, somebody wanted to kill me. I, I was one of them. <laughs> and and um, all I know is this. This poor guy, he couldn't stop drinking. That's me. He tried to help himself. That's me. He died. It happens to so many of us, you know. And, and years ago when I came to AA, you said to me, you know, Sia, a lot of the things that happen to you are because of your drinking. That's a reason. 
but it's not an excuse. Don't ever use it for that. Because if you do, what happens is you'll become a victim. And a victim, by definition, is not going to do the stuff that we need to around here. And, and I gave that some thought. And you know what I realized? I realized that I would be willing to do the stuff in AA that you asked me to do, that you showed me by your example. I would do that whether I liked it or not. Because when I looked at my drinking, I did a lot of stuff, whether I liked it or not to get a drink. And uh, the time came when um, people suggested I needed to pray. They suggested I needed to get on my knees and pray. And um, that was an appointment I really didn't want to make. And uh, they asked me what those terms honestly mean to me. And it asks us in the book. You know, this isn't a rote thing. And, and, and they said, what do the terms honestly mean to you? What does God mean to you? And I didn't want to answer that because I haven't gotten a good reception on that. But there was a lot riding on it, so I gave it a shot. To me, you know, God was this all-powerful person. That's what I was taught. But God never answered my prayers, as far as I could tell. And, and nobody could explain that to me, and God never did. And if I was to understand it properly, at the hour of my death, God would be like the first one in line to judge me. And I just thought, that's a hell of a one-night stand, you know, and I wanted no part of it. <laughs> and uh, and then in my church as well, the, the martyrs were venerated. They lost got the best seats, you know what I mean? And um, I'm like Bill Wilson. I want to be the number one man. So I, I want the best seats. I want to go. You know, how how's this happen? How, how do you do it? And and I found out that, like, they'd lay people out on the ice till they died for their faith. And, and when, I, when I read that, here's what I realized. <laughs> I, I knew I'd be the first person up off the ice, you know what I mean, saying, <laughs> give me my clothes back and call me a cab because I'm a smart aleck, you know, and, and, and I never liked him anyway or something like that. And, and usually if I was as candid as that, it was not well received. But you know what? Alcoholics Anonymous surprised me. You always have. Because you said to me, well, it sounds like your belief makes you uncomfortable, Sia. Okay. But you believe it. And see, it's what we believe that is the cornerstone of faith, not how pretty it is, not how great it is. What do you believe? <laughs> and, and, and you said, if you will pray to that which you believe, you will be able to stay sober a day at a time. And, and, and so I did it. That was the 12-step call you paid on me. That was huge. And it's because you were an alcoholic like me and, and because I could lay it out there to you because you said to me that I could do that. You know, you said to me, let's get a look at you, Sia. Be honest. Be honest. You can be honest in AA. People have been there, done that, you know, got the T-shirt. And and so uh, I got the miracle of sobriety. I got the gift. What am I still doing here? You know, Christmas came. I got the gift. What am I still doing here? And and here's what I found out. You know, I started to feel better. And we clean up nicely, we say. And a little time passed. And it started to feel like this bad thing that happened to me a while ago. And then I, I read in the book that the problem centers in the mind. And, and I realized that that's not in the bottle. And that that's not in the past. You know, that's now. And and what I found out is that my thinking is an awful lot like my drinking if I'm not working a program. My thinking is uh <laughs> my thinking is vile. It's oversexed. It's without a program, it's 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 violent, it's it's incessant, it's depressive, uh it's like it has its own special effects unit, you know what I mean? It's got that that thing, you know, surround sound, high definition resolution imagery, and, and I'm subscribed to like this apocalyptic channel I don't remember joining twenty four hours a day, seven days a week, you know what I mean? And 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 my problems are like these people that I used to meet in the bar, do you remember that? And, and, and I'd like them, so I'd invite them home with me. And, and then they'd move in. And, and then they'd, like, take over. Do you remember that? That's what happened to me. They'd take over. And then I'd get, like, all obsessed with them. You know, I'd be watching them. And, and, and then I'd be thinking about them all the time. And, and then if I win the program, I'd be writing about them all the time, my problems. Then I'd be talking to people about them all the time. And then I paid people to sit down and talk about them with me. You know what I mean? And uh, it, it, it got overwhelming. It was overwhelming because there was no off button. You know, drinking was my off button. And, and, and what do you do? And I went to people and I said, what do you do here? And, 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 and I remember this lady in OA years ago said to me that she thought, she thought the alcoholic was such a lucky person because the alcoholic stops drinking and they never have to touch it again. But she has to eat three times a day. And, and, and I thought about this and I realized that lady is wrong because it's not about drinking is a symptom. It's the problem centers in the mind. You know, I got that. 
And, and uh, what was happening is, you know, it says that we go to the gates of insanity and death. And, and I needed to work my program on this thinking or I was going to lose my mind. And you told me that. You know, you said work your program. Uh, and and, and I, I'm sarcastic and I'm a smart ass and I'm a know-it-all. And I was like, oh, I get it. You know, like a little spiritual iPod. You just program your thinking. And, and, uh, and what I did is I made a decision at that point in my sobriety. It's unfortunate. But I made a decision to live at the spiritual poverty level in Alcoholics Anonymous. John talks about work on the steps. And I made a decision to live in this spiritually rich nation at the lower end of the spectrum. You know, if you think about Alcoholics Anonymous, our currency is, it's so amazingly strong. We, we are people who are bankrupt, you know, and, and we're turned into going human concerns. I don't know all of you because I don't go here regularly. I know a few of you. But I know in my meeting, there's people there and they've been restored to life. You know, they face life on life's terms. And, and, and I realized Alcoholics Anonymous does this remarkable thing. I mean, I got my family back. I didn't want my family back. I'd like you to know that. But I, I got my family back in sobriety. You know what I mean? And, and I was restored to a job and, and the community. Why do you think they let us have meetings in places like this? Alcoholics Anonymous helps far more than the alcoholic. Alcoholics Anonymous helps families and, and communities. It's, it's a, this remarkable organization. And yet in the face of that evidence, I made that decision that I was going to pick and choose the steps. And, um, and you know, I paid a price for that. I, I got close to suicide a few times. And I mention that because you don't have to do that if you're new here. I had a sponsor. I'm just a self-willed person. And um, I had a couple of deterrents, and I feel lucky about it. One is the fact that um, my sponsor was suicidal, and she knew who she was dealing with. And um, she said to me, she never told me not to that I couldn't kill myself. And I so much appreciate AA. It's so unusual in this. When I came here, I had had my share of drinking. And nobody in any of the meetings I ever went to turned to me and said, you don't get, you don't deserve another drop. You know, you miserable whatever. Nobody said that to me. And, 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 and it gave me some dignity. I had so little dignity left when I came here. Didn't you feel like that? And, and my sponsor never said to me, you can't kill yourself. But what she said to me is, see ya? First of all, she said, you're not very good at this, <laughs> so keep that in mind. But she said, if you do go for it, I, I would not sponsor you again. And, and, and it would be my considered opinion that you'd have to start your sobriety over. And, and I felt okay with that. I thought about it. The reason I felt okay with it is, um, you know, we have this fatal malady. It's triggered by alcohol. And what amazes me is some of us go out there and we call it a slip when we drink. And that's not a slip. That's just suicide. You know, you just didn't do it good, which I'm glad if you're back. But, but, and so I didn't have a problem with that. But the other deterrent to me is the fact that my sponsor had a spiritual awakening. Do you know what I mean? And, and when I decided not to work the whole program, I was at that part. You remember the part in the book with the Wright brothers and, 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 you know, saying to them, gentlemen, this plane will never fly. This won't work. That's what I said. Contempt prior to investigation. And I guess that works okay for a plane, but it works bad for sobriety. And my sponsor had this spiritual awakening, and she was all joyous, flying all over the place with the Wright brothers, I guess. I don't know. You know what I mean? And um, she was like, um, many people remember Chuck C., People felt like Chuck C. knew God. You know, he was just joyful. People followed him around pu like puppy dogs. They just loved him. And, and my sponsor had this spiritual awakening. And so what she was is she was a vision for me. Because uh, this is a place where I'm depending on her experience, that she's been there, done that, got the T-shirt. You know what I mean? This is a place where the professionals couldn't roll the dice with me either. They'd say stuff to me like, you know what, Sia, you, you, you can't tell me you're going to kill yourself. I have to write it down. I have to call somebody. We would have to commit you. We'd have to medicate. And I don't know how you feel about Alcoholics Anonymous, but I, I didn't get here to dummy down. Do you know what I mean? It says that this is a bridge to normal living. So, so where is it? You know what I mean? Where is it? And uh, eventually I reached a point where I stood at a turning point again in sobriety. And I was going to ask God's protection and care with complete abandon. And it's as simple as that. And I remember turning to somebody in a meeting, an old timer who I respected, and I said, something's not right. I was so sorry I said it the minute I said it because of my pride, but it probably saved my life. I said, something's not right because I was sponsoring people. I was secretary of a big meeting. I was married to a guy, and we were like, 
you know, one of the Mr. and Mrs. AA people, and, and, um, and he said, tell me about your program, this guy. And I was so proud. <laughs> I walked right into this, like, sucker punched. I was like, well, I sponsor these people. Nah, 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 nah. And he looked at me for a minute, and he said, oh, I see. You're keeping yourself sober, huh? And he walked away. I wanted to kill him. You know what I mean? <laughs> But I called him and I asked him to help me. And, and you know what? He was right. He was right. This is a 12-step program. It is not a boutique program. It is not a do-it-yourself program. It is not a me program. It is a we program. And, and that was a very perilous journey that I embarked on. I feel grateful that I got through that period. And I feel grateful that I, I uh, embraced the program as it is, the full program. And it revitalized my sobriety. And... Um, I want to talk for a moment about some of the things that happened for me in sobriety. If you're new, that might matter to you. Uh, for example, I, I hated my parents when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. I felt like so much of my life was their fault. And uh, Alcoholics Anonymous did a couple things right away with that. First of all, they said that my father was an alcoholic. I grew up in an alcoholic home. It's not why I'm alcoholic. In fact, it's interesting I would become alcoholic because he was not an advertisement for it. Do you know what I mean? There was nothing that my father did when drinking that made it attractive to me. I was a little kid that would wait up for him. That's this family dynamic with alcoholism. And he'd miss the driveway, park on the lawn, fall out of the car, and go wake up the neighbors. Do you know what I mean? And I would sit there listening to him and the neighbors trying to get him to go away, turn in the the porch light off real quick, hoping he'd fall off the porch, you know, like a raccoon in the garbage can or something like that. And, and, and I would sit there and think, why? Why would he do that? Why would he humiliate himself with the neighbors? Why would he lose everything we owned and we went down the tubes with him? Why would he want to be held up for ridicule in our town? You know, I, I just couldn't understand it. And I thought I will never be like that. You know, that was one of my old ideas. I'll never do it. Self-will, man. And and behind my own back, I became an alcoholic anyway. You know what I mean? And so Alcoholics Anonymous right away said to me, you know what, Sia, get over it. We're not holding it against you that you're an alcoholic, so you better find a way. Some old-timer said you must have missed something in the big book, Sia. And um, they said I didn't seem to have a lot to do anyway. Why don't I check it out? And you know what? I followed that direction. And, and I probably felt the same about it as I felt about direction often from my sponsor, like, what a stupid idea. <laughs> but, but I do it, see. It doesn't matter how you feel about it. It doesn't matter about your attitude. This is not a program of motives. I'm so glad somebody told me that. You know, I crept in here by the campfire, and I want to stay with you. And some of us came further away than others, and, 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 and I got my shot here. And so I started reading the book again. And it doesn't matter what page this happened. It's the fact that I was willing to follow somebody else's idea besides my own. On some page, I just suddenly suddenly got it. I had a little spiritual awakening that my dad had a monkey on his back, just like me. You know what I mean? And he meant to be a great guy, just like me. And I had done my steps in Alcoholics Anonymous in terms of the inventory and the amends. And I realized I meant to be a great guy too. You know, I didn't mean to use abortion for birth control. And I didn't mean to move in with the guy that took care of me for five years financially. And then when he got injured, I moved in with the neighbor within a week. You know, I didn't mean to be that kind of person, but that's the kind of person that I was. And, and Bill Wilson says that everybody is suffering from the pangs of growing up. And I, and I was given this moment of compassion for my father. And, 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 and so I got to hold his hand when he died some years later. You know, we were completely reconciled. And, and I would not have had that without Alcoholics Anonymous. And, and I hated my mother as well. My mother uh, had a nervous breakdown when I was a kid, and she was like crazy, and she scared me, and she screamed, and I felt like she drove my father away, and I was never going to forgive her for that. And Alcoholics Anonymous said, you're going to take contrary action on that, because see, these resentments will make you drink, see ya. And because you said that to me, and because I never want to drink again, <laughs> and may I never forget that feeling, God. You know, I became willing to take these actions, and I, like, sent my mom Mother's Day cards. It doesn't matter if you mean it, see ya. And I'd say, it's phony, and they'd say, you're phony anyway, so who cares, you know what I mean? <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and so I would do it, you know, and, uh, and I was counting. Do you do that? Like, oh yeah, you're not going to take advantage of me, and I was counting them, and, and, and then I just lost count, and, and I was helping my mom one day move, and um, we were moving some stuff around, and we stopped for a few minutes to rest, I guess. And my mom started crying, and my mom started crying, and she told me about this time when she was a kid, and she went someplace, and she was assaulted. And she tried to tell her mom about it, I guess, and, and her mom, like, didn't believe her or something. And, and I was looking at my mom crying her eyes out, and, you know, uh, 
I don't know how many times this happened to my mom, but here's the thing. Something like, like that happened to me when I was a kid, too. And I had said to myself, I'm never telling anybody about it. I'm going to die before anybody knows. And I walked in Alcoholics Anonymous. You saw me coming, and you said pretty much, you know, you'll stay as sick as the secrets that you keep. And so I divested myself of these things one by one. If you're new, it doesn't have to be from a podium. It's just that I am perfectly comfortable in Alcoholics Anonymous with some of the things I thought I could never divulge to another person. And, and, and I had done that here. And as I looked at my mother, My heart broke open for my mom. I had a moment of compassion because I realized my mom was this broken person. And I realized in that same minute that somehow Alcoholics Anonymous, this program, had healed me. You know, when I walked into Alcoholics Anonymous, it said where two or more are gathered. What did I think they were talking about, that there's coffee here? No. You know, it says there he is in our midst. Did I think they meant Bill, you know? And, 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 it says, Dr. Silkworth, I think, says something like, if you come, may you, if you come to scoff, may you remain to pray. And to a certain extent, I guess I had, I had come and I had remained, but I had scoffed at part of the program. I had scoffed behind my own back. And, uh, and I was, a wonderful feeling to realize that there's no Alcoholics Anonymous for my mother, but I'm the big book. I'm the big book for my mom. And, you know, I, I'm at the center of my family now. And I have been able to to be of assistance to people in AA. And um, I got married in Alcoholics Anonymous. You taught me it's like a closed meeting. You know, only the participants participate. And... Um, and then one day my husband said he didn't want to be married anymore, and, and we got a divorce, and, and I hated it. I remember not wanting to tell anybody that because we were that little AA couple. And I went to a meeting, and I heard some lady, uh, I don't know, I shared it because I was afraid I'd drink, and some lady came up to me and said, when my husband left, I drank. And I remember thinking, thanks, lady, because you know what she reminded me of? My primary purpose here is not to be married My primary purpose here is not to have buddies. It's not to get a job. It's not to be restored to the community. It's to be sober and carry the message. She did that simple thing for me, you know, and it counted a lot. And uh, my husband and I separated, divorced, and, you know, those are angry things that happen. But you taught me to keep my mouth shut and behave like a lady. And some time passed, and uh, my former husband became incredibly ill. And he called me, and he asked me to help him. He was dying. He asked me to help him. He asked me to help him because one time he came back to L.A., he'd moved away, and he stood up at a podium and took a cake. And he turned to me in a meeting like this size, and he said, See, I want to tell you what a great example of Alcoholics Anonymous you are to me in ways you may know and ways you may not. And, and, and we reconciled. We were friends. That's because you made me keep the door open. Who knows where you carry this message? And so he was dying and he asked me to come and help him. And you know, I was with someone else and I still am. And I asked him what he thought of that. And he's an Alcoholics Anonymous too. And he said, you need to go. You need to help him. This man that I lived with. And, and so I, I went and I was of service to my former husband. And then the son of a bitch lived. You know what I mean? <laughs> line, right? (laughs) Anyway, I think it's time for me to close. We're hot. You're hot. You're a wonderful group. I want to thank Alcoholics Anonymous for the 12-step call you paid on me and keep coming back. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.